Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is primary day, which means we are watching what's going on in Georgia and in Texas and in Alabama, obviously also in Arkansas, although there's not, not a lot of drama there. And we are joined today by Rick Hassan, who is the professor of law and political science at the University of California, Irvine, and uh, is going to be joining the faculty at the UCLA Law School this fall and, more importantly, uh, his latest book is Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. His earlier books include Election Meltdown and The Voting Wars. So this seems timely, Rick. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Okay, so before we get into the whole question of cheap speech and disinformation, can you clear up some things about election law since you've written about this rather extensively? So have have Republicans decided they kind of actually like mail-in voting, at least in some circumstances, like in Pennsylvania? I mean, is a little bit of cognitive dissonance here? Well, before Donald Trump came along, mail-in voting was used extensively by Republicans, especially in places like Florida, which has a long tradition of mail-in voting, where you could take the state of Utah, heavily Republican state, that does almost all its voting by mail. I mean, it really is a new phenomenon that dates back to just the last few years that there's been this attack on mail-in voting. And you see now in, in Pennsylvania, in a very close Republican uh, primary race for the U.S. Senate, that there's, um, you know, it's a very close race. There's going to be litigation, but nobody's saying, you know, these ballots are fraudulent. You, you can't trust them or anything like that. So it really is a Trump-specific phenomenon that caused a lot of cognitive dissonance among some Republicans who had long supported using vote by mail as a very effective way of getting out the vote among their most ardent supporters. Okay, so this this getting down in the weeds a little bit, but you know, one of the issues in Pennsylvania, for example, is whether or not they're going to count ballots that were turned in on time, legal ballots, but uh, did not have the date written on the envelope, I guess, right? And apparently last night the both the Republican National Committee and the state party are intervening in this lawsuit. Um, David McCormick wants them counted. He is running against Dr. Oz. So uh, David McCormick, uh, who is not the Trump endorsed candidate, apparently likes the mail-in ballots. The RNC and uh, the Republican Party are intervening against McCormick uh, against in this suit over the undated uh, ballots. And as you pointed out on Twitter last night, so in other words, they want to disenfranchise some of their own valid voters who forgot to write the the date next to their names. It is interesting watching this play out as an intra-Republican fight. Yes, and it does have a, a very different feel to it. But, uh, you know, let, let me just explain what's going on with these ballots, um, because there's a big difference between what's going on now and what happened back in 2020. Yeah. Back in 2020, a uh, states uh, the state supreme court in pennsylvania had ordered that ballots that were received up to three days after election day would would be counted mm -hmm. and there was a whole a lawsuit that went all the way to the supreme court and the supreme court never fully resolved the question of whether or not those ballots should have been counted or not these were ballots that came in after the deadline from uh, that was set by state law in this case what's going on now all of these ballots were received by election day. There's no question about them com complying with state law in terms of timing. The voter simply forgot to fill out on the uh, envelope the date, you know, just mm -hmm. for signed and signed and date your ballot, didn't date it. And in a separate case involving a local election just this week, coincidentally, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit applied a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says voters can't be disenfranchised for making an immaterial mistake, mm. a mistake that really doesn't matter right. to the outcome. It seems relevant. Right. So as soon as this decision came out from the Third Circuit, and the Third Circuit didn't even issue its opinion yet, it just issued its order that these ballots have to be counted, opinion to follow, the McCormick campaign sent letters to all of the counties uh, saying, if you've got any of these ballots, and we think there could be at least hundreds of them where the voters got them in on time, but didn't sign them, but didn't date them, uh, you should count those. And then the Oz campaign sends something saying, no, you shouldn't. And the counties are doing different things about how to deal with these ballots. So McCormick has sued uh, to require that the ballots be counted. And uh, Oz is, is opposing it. Uh, Trump, you may remember on election night said, Oz is ahead, he should just declare victory, you know, typical Trump playbook, you know. If the counting's in my favor, stop the counting. 
Um, and, um, you know, now, as you said, the, the RNC and the Pennsylvania GOP are coming in on the side of uh, Oz saying that these voters who are all Republican voters, it's a Republican primary, should be disenfranchised because they made this immaterial mistake. Uh, and I think they see the larger play here, which is that they want to be able to disenfranchise voters for technicalities. Well, this is our future, isn't it? I mean, debating things like this, especially in a political culture in which it is not certain that the loser will acknowledge the fact that they have lost and and agree to a peaceful tr- transfer of power. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of things. But, you know, fundamentally, and you talk about this, you know, fundamentally, th- that is at the heart of what we mean when we talk about democracy is that when you have lost, you acknowledge the loss and you make way for uh, the winner of the election. If that breaks down, everything breaks down, right? I mean, there's, I mean, that 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 is in a category all of its own. Yes, absolutely. And and political scientists have a name for that. It's it's called loser's consent. You know, you have right. a, an election that's fair, and the losers grumble, but they you know agree to fight another day. I mean, this is why you know I took a lot of heat when I wrote Election Meltdown because I said that. Stacey Abrams should not have refused to say that Brian Kemp was the legitimate governor of, of Georgia. You know, I think that there was an attempt to suppress some votes in Georgia, but I don't think the election was run in such an unfair way that you could say that it was a fundamentally unfair election. The losers should not accept the results. Uh, so Donald Trump is is not the only one who has made these kinds of comments, but he's obviously taken it to a whole new level. No, I, no, since we're talking about Georgia, there's a piece in the Washington Post that points out that that despite these new laws, which, you know, Democrats have described as voter suppression, um, that the voter turnout is, in fact, up in, you know, defenders of this law, in, including Brad Raffensperger, said that many of the criticism has been exaggerated. And the Post points out that a lot of the rhetoric directed at the Georgia bill was actually based on a on draft legislation that was subsequently scaled back. And there was a lot of pushback, uh, put a tremendous pressure on Republicans in the legislature to strip out some of the more contentious provisions. And so in the end, um, Republicans had agreed to drop uh, language barring most Georgians from voting by mail and curtailing early voting on weekends. They even expanded early voting hours in the final bill. So let's just talk about this because there's still a lot of heavy breathing about this bill. And I have been highly critical of it. But I've gotten a lot of pushback from folks who say, OK, here's what's actually in the bill and here's what people claimed in the bill. And this is what was changed. Where, where, what do you think? Where do you come down on this? So I think I think the Georgia situation is very complicated. You're right that the proposed bill was much worse. Um, and it took, I think, a lot of pressure, especially from the business community, and this happened in Texas as well, to remove the most onerous or, or troublesome parts of these bills. So I never thought that it was quite as bad as some people portrayed it. That said, provisions that say that you can't give water to a voter who's waiting on a long line to vote, no. that seems problematic to me. I also think that the rules that were put in place that make voting by mail much harder uh, are likely to disenfranchise voters. And, you know, the way I look at this is uh, just because they turn out is uh, the same or up doesn't mean that there wasn't a barrier. It just means that people have overcome the barrier. And you should really ask the question, is this barrier that's been put in front of voters there for a good reason? Right. And so I think we can't just judge from turnout whether this is a good law or a bad law. And in fact, and I, I wrote about this when the Georgia law first passed, the provision in it that gives me the most concern is not one that potentially makes it harder for people to vote, but one that makes it easier to subvert election right. outcomes. I mean, this is really my concern is about takeovers of county election boards. And this issue is very complicated. So sometimes a state needs to come in and say that a county is incompetent in how it's running its elections. And I think, for example, of the Democrat uh, in Michigan, Jocelyn Benson, who mm-hmm. sent in Chris Thomas, who's a Republican, one of the the, the, the former person who, who ran elections in Michigan. He basically came in to oversee Detroit because they had a history of maladministration, which I write a lot about mm-hmm. in my election meltdown book. And fortunately, he was there. And so all of the he, things went pretty smoothly in Detroit. And all of the claims that you know Detroit had bungled the, the vote in 2020 turned out to be wrong because because he was there. And there have been problems in Fulton County, Georgia, too, with how they run their elections. 
That said, it looked like the provisions that would allow the state to take over a place like Fulton County, where there are lots and lots of Democrats, uh, could be manipulated politically to try to get in there, muck things up, and mess with uh, how um, the vote is conducted there in a way that could potentially swing the outcome of an election. So I worry more about these attempts at election subversion than the suppressive aspects of the Georgia law, which are, I think, uncertain. Yeah, I, I think the existential threat is really the counting of the votes and uh, the ability of uh, of partisans to overturn elections um, as opposed to, you know, what the policy is on drop boxes. But that that's my take. So let's talk about today's primary in Georgia, because, you know, clearing away all of the detritus around, you know, you know, Republican politics. This is an up or down referendum on the big lie, isn't it? I mean, there's no the only reason why David Perdue is running against Brian Kemp because is because Donald Trump wanted him to do it because he's mad that Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger would not steal the election for him. And, you know, in, in that sense, it is uh, very close to a referendum on whether or not Republican primary voters are going to stick with the the the, the lie about the election that, that Donald Trump is obsessed with. Do you agree? Well, you know, it's I, I just just before we got on uh, the this uh, podcast, I saw that Purdue, in addition to making these racist comments yesterday, uh, also uh, said, you know, he'll he'll see if he would concede. It would depend <laughs> on if there's fraud. So, you know, he's certainly bought into this. You know, there are two races I'm watching in Georgia. You mentioned one of them, which is the governor's race. The other is the Raffensperger yeah, Heiss huge. primary. Heiss is a uh, Republican congressman, Jody Heiss, who has embraced the big lie. Uh, you know, voted against certification of the Biden victory and is, you know, is running on a platform of the big lie. Now, it could well be that Purdue is crushed, as the polling is showing by Kemp, but that Heiss and Raffensperger go to a runoff. Yeah. Well, you know, what does this tell us about the resonance of the big lie? And I think one of the things it tells us is that the elites in the Republican Party and I would say in the Democratic Party and among, you know, us, the chattering class, the the pundits and the and 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 the uh, academics who study this, we're all obsessed with you know whether or not we're going to have an attempt to subvert the election in 2024. But voters are not. Voters see an incumbent who they think did a pretty good job, and Republican uh, voters I'm talking about in in Georgia, and so they're willing to give him another term. And you know the stuff about the big lie is not resonating. Uh, then again, Raffensperger has has been attacked a lot by Trump enough that he's not going to probably get over the 50% mark to avoid a runoff because there's a, a subset of the uh, Republican Party base that is very agitated about how the 2020 election was run and will vote on that issue. So for most voters, I think they're just going along in their normal lives, not worrying about election subversion, not worrying about if the last election was stolen. But for, you know, for for elites and for a, a core group of Republican voters, this still resonates a lot. So I, I'm really concerned about the yeah. the uh, Heiss-Raffensperger race. I mean, imagine that Heiss ends up winning the primary ultimately and goes on in the general election. Let's say he runs the election completely fairly. And let's say it's Trump versus Biden too. And he says, yeah, Trump's won the state, which, you know, which is certainly a possible thing that could happen uh, given how purple Georgia mm -hmm. is. Are Democrats and those on the left going to believe the the, the 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 big lie person when he says that the election was fairly run? And he's you know so I think we have a crisis of confidence on the left, the way we've had a crisis of confidence on the right. And that point about losers' consent, which we talked about earlier, is going to be under even more pressure. No, I agree. I think that that is almost inevitable. So I want to talk about uh, your your new book, uh, and I've heard you talk about this uh, cheap speech: how disinformation poisons our politics. And most interesting, how to cure it. Let's talk about that right after this. Well, it doesn't take a genius to realize we're headed back to the 1970s with inflation at all time high and the Fed sounding the alarm. But every cloud has a silver lining. In fact, I found what I'm calling the 1970s opportunity, because while the 70s weren't perfect, a lot of things were. Housing prices were not insane. People could still afford food. And gold soared from $200 to $2,500 per ounce in the following decade. And while gold is at a high today, the 1970s opportunity today isn't gold. It's a $1.7 trillion market 
that's more than 275 years old, and it's making the rich even richer. And this opportunity is being swept under the rug. But our listeners can uncover the rest of the story at masterworks.io and use promo code BULWARK. That's masterworks.io, promo code BULWARK. Before deciding to invest, carefully review Regulation A disclosures at masterworks.io slash CD. Again, that's masterworks.io code BULWARK. Okay, we are back with Rick Hassan, who is a nationally known expert on elections, and uh, his new book, Cheap Speeches, has uh, just been published by Yale University Press. So let's talk about this. Cheap speech, isn't that a good thing? Don't we want speech to be cheap? Because, I mean, at one point, we were all worried about, hey, you know what, uh, You know, money in politics is just too dominant, it's too expensive to get involved. And now we've seen this incredible democratization of speech, but it's not an unalloyed good, is it, Rick? Right. So I think this is a mixed bag, right? So on the one hand, where, it, you know, it's, it is great that, you know, you think back to, say, the 1970s, you don't like a, an editorial that appears in the New York Times. What can you do about it? You can write a letter to the editor. Uh, there's probably hundreds coming in. If you're very lucky, it'll get published. If not, you can just kind of yell into the wind. You know, there was no response. There were three major television networks one or two local newspapers, and, and that was it. Now, anyone with any thought whatsoever can simply come in and say what they think. And if their ideas have resonance, if they go viral, you know, they can spread far and wide. And, and that's great. And, you know, it allows for people with similar interests and political views to find each other. And, and all of that is, I think, good. We have the knowledge of the world in the palm of our hands. You can look up just about anything on your smartphone and 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 in cheap flow of information all good but there's a dark side too which is that uh, as technology has changed over the last say 15 years the intermediaries that helped voters determine what's true and what's not true the economic model supporting them has collapsed so journalists have lost jobs faster than coal miners uh, over the last decade and a half and those uh, journalists and others helped voters determine what's true and what's false. They were intermediaries that provided kind of value. Same thing with political parties. Now, you know, if you're Marjorie Taylor Greene, you can go directly to people say the most outrageous things and include a link that costs basically nothing to be able to fundraise. And the parties have a lot less control. So it, it creates room for demagoguery. One of the claims I make at the beginning of cheap speech is that if we had the same polarized politics of today, but the technology of the 1950s, we probably would not have seen the January 6th insurrection or a majority of Republican voters believing that the 2020 election was stolen. You know, Donald Trump went to Twitter over 400 times, according to a New York Times count, between November 3rd when the election was held and, and, and about three weeks later, making the false claims that the election was stolen or rigged. In the 1950s, if he went up to the podium at the White House 400 times, he, it, he wouldn't have got his claims repeated, and they wouldn't have been repeated without context, without fact-checking. And so it's a lot harder for voters to determine what's true and what's false, which is really important in elections. And so cheap speech is, speech is cheap in, the, in a second sense of the term that it prioritizes lower valued speech over higher valued speech. At least it can do that. You know, and you, you point out, you know, that, that it is harder and harder to determine what is true. And we haven't even confronted the impact of things like deep fakes showing politicians doing or saying things they didn't do or say. I mean, that, that hasn't been a major factor yet, but that also feels like it's inevitable that that's going to be a factor. And it's going to be very, very difficult for people to to sort that out, particularly if if it happens close to an election. If you think about what Donald Trump did when he was building his political power is that he attacked all the intermediaries that help us to determine what's true or what's not right. Of course, he attacked the press as the true enemy of the people. He mm -hmm. attacked the opposition party. He attacked his own party. He attacked the judiciary and the FBI, right? So all of the different organizations and entities that help voters determine what's true uh, now we can't trust them. You know, you can't trust the fact checkers, right? So who can you trust? And so it's one thing when we have different opinions uh, about facts in the world, you know, how should we deal with immigration? You know, what should be our policy on taxes? It's another thing 
when we disagree about the facts themselves, because then you don't have a common basis upon which to have a reasoned discussion. So how much of this is supply and how much of this is demand? So we have this big flood of disinformation, but you also have this uh, willing audience that is lapping it up, uh, goes to it, uses it, spreads it around, believes it. And I guess the question is, at bottom, do people want true information or do they want information that simply confirms their biases? You know what I'm saying here? I mean, yes, right. So an another way of phrasing this is, you know, do we have a a supply problem or do we have a demand problem? Mm -hmm. And I think it's both, right? So there are a number of people who've gotten very rich spreading misinformation and disinformation, yeah. you know, not the least of which is Donald Trump, who was able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars for supposedly for his, his legal fund, but most of it went into a kind of leadership pack slush fund that he can use for lots of personal expenses. So we, we should not ignore the, the financial side of all of this misinformation, disinformation about elections and about politics can serve both financial and political purposes. But also, you know, if you feel like you're losing your country and you can't understand why, say, Joe Biden would get five million more votes than Donald Trump, being able to explain it with fraud is, is a very appealing thing. And so this is kind of a demand for this disinformation as well. And so then the question is, you know, how do you solve that problem? And in the book, I try and talk about mostly ways of giving voters easier access to accurate information. So even though we have these pathologies that have, have arisen because of the, the rise of, of cheap speech, I don't think that censorship is the answer. Uh, let's look at what happened with this disinformation board that the Department of Homeland Security is going to set up. I mean, just picture whichever president you uh, distrust the most and imagine that she gets to appoint the head of this board, right? It sounds <laughs> Orwellian, right? So you don't want that, right? So uh, there are only two narrow circumstances where I think we actually want to shut down speech. One is foreign uh, speech, and the Supreme Court has said that mm -hmm. it's perfectly constitutional under the First Amendment to say that foreign entities can't try to influence our elections in certain ways, and speech that lies about when, where, or how people vote, uh, you know, telling people uh, that they can vote by text uh, or social media hashtag, as someone did, and got 5,000 voters to try to vote in that way. But most of what I want to do is give voters better information. For example, one of the things I'm worried about are these deep fakes. These are using artificial intelligence uh, to create videos or audio that might make it look like, you know, President Biden's having a heart attack or uh, mm. Pre President Trump is, is saying a racial epithet, something like that. Uh, so I want those videos labeled as altered. So voters will realize when they're looking at this that, oh, this isn't what's really happening. You know, that's a kind of information assisting device. So that's helpful if it's a supply problem. It's less helpful if it's a demand problem and voters want the false information and they won't believe the label that, you know, Twitter is forcing on them to tell them that the video is, is altered. So it's a really tough nut to crack when you think about it. And I think law is not going to be enough to get us out of this box. Well, you also talk about uh, transparency, uh, you know, changing election administration to make it more transparent and fair and going back to uh, Georgia, uh, like what happened with Brad Raffensperger. You know, after Trump told him to find 11,000 more votes, you know, they did a full hand recount. They showed the results of the election were correct. They helped shut down the conspiracies in Georgia. But we're going to find out whether that worked, because it's hard for me to imagine that they could have done more in terms of transparency, right? I mean, if, if that's the solution, we're going to find out whether that works, right? Right. Well, there's lots of different things that need to be transparent in elections. Chain of custody, you know, what happens to the ballots after they are collected in polling places? You know, where are they stored? You know, transparency in terms of what the rules are going to be if there's a dispute over the counting of ballots, right? So there's room for transparency all along the way. And there's also room for transparency in terms of who is trying to influence our elections. So, you know, it might matter if it's a group of uh, Russian government operators trying to pretend they're black activists and telling Hillary Clinton supporters not to vote in 2016. Or another example I talk about in the book is in 2017, when Jeff Sessions became the attorney general, and there was the Roy Moore, Doug Jones race. There were some supporters of Jones without Jones's knowledge who were pretending that they were Baptist uh, teetotalers and they wanted to ban alcohol in the state of <laughs> uh, in, in the right. state of Alabama, vote for Roy Moore. And the purpose of this was to disincentivize 
moderate Republicans to come out and vote. Mm -hmm. And it would help to know who's actually behind the messaging that's trying to influence us. So we can have transparency in the election administration process, as well as transparency in who's trying to influence our votes. Right now, if you get a TV ad supporting a candidate for federal office, and you get that TV ad, and it comes to you through your cable box, or it comes to you through direct TV or satellite provider, there are certain requirements of disclosure of who's funding the ad. But if that same ad comes to you, it's still uh, coming to you on your TV, but it's coming through YouTube TV or Hulu through your internet signal, it's not subject to disclosure rules Interesting. because we haven't updated our rules you know, for what counts as a communication since the early 2000s and things have changed. So we need to give voters that kind of information. This is an interesting issue because, as you point out in your book, you know, conservative justices like uh, Antonin Scalia it were, you know, said that they were in favor of greater disclosure laws. But the Republicans in Congress now have flopped on that. Uh, they're they're not in favor of them. And the current Supreme Court appears to rely on this marketplace of ideas, which assumes the truth is going to emerge somehow. But as you point out, in a time of cheap speech, that that's not likely. So these disclosure laws seem like obvious things to do if that was possible. But without the Supreme Court, without Congress, it's going to be up to voters and consumers to do things, you argue. It's like what what? Because I think people feel powerless about this. If Congress isn't going to act, if the courts aren't going to act, what do we do about this? Right. So, you know, I think there are some things that voluntarily can be done. And, you know, this is an issue that's you know, by the time this podcast gets released, we might have a decision from the Supreme Court uh, about this uh, new Texas law yeah. that would require the replatforming of Donald Trump, among other things. And I believe, and the 11th Circuit ruled yesterday consistently with, with the position I take in the book, it's contrary to the position of uh, Justice Thomas and also of Eugene Volokh, who is the law professor who coined the term cheap speech. I think that these companies are private entities, just like you know, Fox News or the New York Times, the First Amendment doesn't apply to private actors. You don't get to tell them you must cover Donald Trump or you must cover Joe Biden's speech, right? We let these decisions be made. So if Elon Musk buys Twitter and he decides he's going to make it a Trump propaganda machine, that's his right to do, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what you do about that? Well, so one thing is voters can choose not to use these platforms, now, that's somewhat hard to do when the platforms have a lot of power. So maybe the solution is not a speech law, but to push for antitrust laws. I mean, do we really think that the same company should own Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram? Uh, you think about Google being premier in search, but also owning YouTube, which is incredibly powerful. So maybe we need more competition. I think, you know, antitrust might be an answer, but also the employees of these companies. And we're seeing some pushback. We saw it at Facebook when Mark Zuckerberg didn't do enough to deal with disinformation on his platform. We see this now with Twitter, where the employees are concerned. So I think that there's a lot that can be done just in terms of trying to organize people in the marketplace to say, you know, this is not what we want when it comes to policing of information by private actors. Again, just like the newspaper can decide what to include or exclude, we should encourage these companies to do the right thing as well. This line used to be very clear and used to be recognized that that the First Amendment dealt with government action um, and did not apply to private actors. For example, you know, um, newspapers were free to publish a letter to the editor, an op-ed piece or not. The government could not force them to do that. And that seems to have been lost when it deals with the social media companies. Elon Musk, you mentioned him taking over uh, Twitter. He appears to, well, at least he has said that his standard for what he will allow is the same standard as the First Amendment, which I'm not sure he's thought that through. Yeah, that's exactly. I don't think he's given five minutes to that, okay? <laughs> so, so imagine that there was no content moderation at all on uh, these social media platforms. It would be filled with pornography, right. hate speech, mm -hmm. you know, ads for um, male enhancement pills, right? I mean- all the kind of stuff, you know, sure, you can have a platform where there's no content moderation, but people wouldn't enjoy being on it. And, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, I, what, what, how much of Elon Musk's interest in Twitter is financial, but if he's actually trying to build the number of people who are going to be on the platform, he's going to have to moderate content. And so what I think he meant was 
uh, when he said that whatever the First Amendment would allow, he was thinking specifically of politicians like Donald Trump. And, you know, if they say something, it should be on there unless it violates the First Amendment. That, I think, is a more defensible position. It's not one I agree with. But yeah. certainly, he would not expect that all content would be allowed on and, and unmoderated if it's something that the, the government wouldn't be able to ban. I mean, there's lots of terrible things out there that I think, rightly, the First Amendment protects people's right to say. But you're not going to want to spend your day scrolling through that over your first cup of coffee. Which he will realize at some point if, in fact, he goes ahead with, okay, so let's talk about you know Donald Trump on Twitter. Did Twitter make the right decision by banning Donald Trump uh, after January 6th? Yes, I think they did. And uh, I think that Facebook made the right decision as well. You know, I think there should be a heavy thumb on the scale against excluding political voices, even political voices of people who have extreme views. But once they have a record of relentlessly undermining the integrity of elections, as Donald Trump did by making hundreds or thousands of claims of, of the election being stolen or false without any reliable information backing it up. And once you encourage violence, remember, it was Donald Trump who, beginning in uh, December, began inviting his supporters to organize and come to the Capitol for a what he called a wild time. You know, and, and you know, if you don't do something, we're not going to have a country anymore. All of that kind of language, I think, uh, it would have been irresponsible to have kept him on the platform. And I think they should have removed him earlier. And I should point out, you know, we don't know if, if Elon Musk is going to end up actually purchasing Twitter and, and what he would do about uh, restoring Trump. But we do know what's going to happen at Facebook. Facebook initially banned Trump indefinitely. But their self-created oversight board, kind of a Supreme Court for Facebook, ruled that Facebook had to put a time limit on it and explain what it would take to get Donald Trump to be back on the platform. And Facebook came back and said, all right, it's a two-year ban. So on January 7th, 2023, Donald Trump is back on the platform unless he's blocked again. And Facebook put out a standard and said, uh, if he's still a threat to the integrity of the democratic process, then he can be left off. And I think he still is. I mean, look at what he said you know, he hasn't stopped with his false election claims about 2020. And he's saying it now about, right, he's saying it about the Pennsylvania race that we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, he's he's willing to say fraud at the drop of a hat. I don't know if you remember back during the Iowa caucuses uh, when Ted I Cruz do. was ahead, he was accused him of fraud. So, you know, Donald Trump cannot lose without fraud is, is the message. He's dangerous. Uh, and, you know, again, it's a private decision. Mark Zuckerberg and the people at Facebook can decide what to do. But I would urge them not to uh, restore him because I think that it just becomes an easy way for him to spread dangerous statements. Again, I'm not saying the government should ban Donald Trump, right? This is a private decision. And he's got his own media platform now. You want to hear what Donald Trump thinks? Go to Truth Social. You can get as much of it as you want. Okay, so the counterpoint to this, though, is the, you know, the, the, the sunlight counterpoint, which is that, okay, here's a man who wants to be president of the United States again. Let's shine the brightest spotlight on him. Um, if he is going to be spreading these lies, let's have it right here, out there, subject to this kind of scrutiny. What's your argument? I mean, generally, that's the position that we would normally take, that if you try to de-platform someone like Donald Trump, they'll simply find another platform. And then this actually enhances their appeal because they can play the victim card. So in some ways, that has not worked out. It has not stopped the spread of the disinformation. I mean, if anything, the big lie has metastasized since Twitter kicked Donald Trump off. So if the goal was to stop the flow of disinformation, then it failed. Well, so first, you know, I think your idea of let him out there so people can critique him, you know, that is the marketplace of ideas yeah. approach that that counter speech is, is always the best remedy. And I think, you know, if that were true, then we wouldn't have, you know, 60 percent of Republican voters or more <laughs> believing that the right. election was stolen. So uh, counter speech has not worked. And, you know, people are saying, well, the concern about disinformation is overblown. I said, well, at least it's not when it comes to election integrity, where disinformation has really uh, gained a foothold. There is some evidence out there that the kinds of lies about the election being stolen have gone down markedly on social media since Donald Trump is, is gone, what, since he's off Facebook and Twitter. So these claims are circulating less, you know, on social media. But 
it's not just about social media, right? They've grabbed a hold on cable news, on One America News Network, Newsmax, you know, the, uh, Fox News. These are places where this stuff is out there. So, you know, it's not as though Donald Trump is not able to get his ideas out there. He still can. But why give him an extra megaphone to spread these lies? And of course, he spreads them in an unmediated way. Now, if Facebook is going to try to, you know, put it in context, that is something. And we saw in earlier in the 2020 election, before Trump was deplatformed, I write about this in Cheap Speech, both Facebook and Twitter tried labels to, you know, say, uh, you know, that this information maybe isn't trustworthy. But Facebook's attempt at labels was so bad that it actually <laughs> seemed to indicate that Trump was telling the truth. It said something uh, like, learn more about elections, yeah. go to USA.gov, you know, which seemed to be endorsing what Trump was saying. Uh, Twitter did a little bit better. You know, this this claim about the election is disputed or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's a lot different than Walter Cronkite being able to get on TV, people to trust him and say, you know, um, Trump has said this or, you know, McCarthy has said this. And here's why that's not true. And so I think that's that uh, it's that lack of the ability to give context that makes a difference. And, and one of the things we know from studying how lies about the election and also about um, COVID vaccines and all this stuff spread on social media is that there are certain super spreaders. Yeah. And so there are studies, you know, there may be you know, two dozen people who are amplifying false information, who are spreading lies about election integrity or about vaccines and things. And if you shut those people down, again, private company can decide what to include and what to exclude. You shut those people down, you, sh you, you take away a lot of the oxygen for these kinds of claims. So let's go back to the main thesis here. The tension between the cheap, lower valued speech and more, you know, and fact-based speech. Part of this is, of course, the dissemination of disinformation, cheap speech, of, you know, the willingness of lying liars to, to lie. But it's also the erosion of, of trust and confidence in what we would describe, what we once described as the mainstream media. Now, I don't know if you want to call it the legacy media. But so what can the, what can the mainstream media do to restore its fate? And this would include some of the things that you suggest, you know, nonprofit investigative reporting. What needs to happen for people who have basically decided, I don't trust the media anymore, therefore I'm going to these sites? What it will it take to get people to think, okay, I will pay attention, I do trust you? Right. So it's really tough because, uh, tough. as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the local media market has uh, collapsed. And so there are nonprofits like uh, Texas Tribune or Nevada Independent that show that you can have a model that covers a state and does deep investigative journalism. ProPublica is partnering with 20 different uh, localities to try to provide this information. And it's important because the political parties and even the, even the Russian government have tried to set up fake local news sites that are really propaganda vehicles. One of the things I think needs to happen is journalistic societies, again, not government, but private entities, uh, should come up with a kind of code of ethics. Like, this is what it means to be a journalist. And these things already exist, but what they can do is they can say, all right, if you subscribe to these things, you know, I will not make a claim unless I have two sources to back it up. Mm -hmm. I will always give the person that I'm writing about a chance to respond, and I will include that response in my story. And then journalists can come up with a kind of good housekeeping seal of approval. You know, so Los Angeles Times, they may not get it right all the time, but at least they're trying. They've pledged to do this. And, you know, there might be fights over who gets the, does Breitbart get the seal of approval or not? And then that seal of approval could be included on social media. So next to Los Angeles Times, you could have a little icon that would tell you, okay, they subscribe to this. This would be another way of giving information to voters. Okay, this is a source that is likely to be true. Not, not for sure, but trying to uh, restore and and then the other thing is that both journalists and social media companies need to admit when they make mistakes, right? So I think there's a lot of overreaction to 2016. The way the Hunter Biden uh, laptop story was yeah. covered, I think, was a big mistake. Huge. You know, taking taking that New York Post story and not allowing it to be spread on Twitter or Facebook that was a big mistake. It was not clear whether it was true or not. But now we know, over a year later after the election, that at least some of the material on Hunter Biden's laptop has proven to be correct. And so I think, you know, those kinds of mistakes need to be owned up to and there need to be steps taken to assure that they don't happen again because some of these 
problems that the media faces uh, are self-inflicted. Well, they, they are. And early on in, in the Trump era, I remember saying, job one, um, the prime director for the media has to be to get it right, because every time they get it wrong or exaggerate uh, or chase down some you know fake rabbit hole, uh, it is weaponized against them. And we've seen how that that has been happening. But unfortunately, in a 24-7 news cycle in which we have about a thousand news cycles every single day, um, you know, the, the incentives are to get things out really fast and, and, and uh, to go with stories that are too good to check necessarily. <laughs> and I, it's hard for me to overstate how much distrust there is that this whole phenomenon of latching onto disinformation is really inseparable from the disillusionment with, uh, with, with, with bias in the media or perceived bias in the media. Yes, no, I think that's exactly right. You know, one of the things it leads to is, you know, I talk about this in cheap speech, um, this market for lemon situation, this idea that we're just going to assume everything is misinformation because we right. can't trust anything. And that's not good for voters either, right? Voters need to know when are they going to be able to trust something that they see or they read. And, and that that is really the, the top, uh, aside from legal change, that is the top private change that we need to see. Well, this is an immensely important book. The book is Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Culture and How to Cure It. Uh, uh, Rick Hasson, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It was great to be with you. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I, I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good Switch. side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like, oh, no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Stone, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? Oh. He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame me that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.